Phoenix police officer killed in the line of duty, and we talk conservation and hunting at the Arizona Archery Club. Welcome to the Mike Broomhead Show. Well, I got a message. I got a song. Can I get a witness? Tell me what's going on. Show the people. Phoenix police officer gives his life in the line of duty. We'll talk about that in a few moments in an interview. A great one as we talk about hunting and conservation in the state of Arizona. Do hunters and fishermen get a bad rap? We go out to the Arizona Archery Club to talk about that. But before that, we start every show off with something we call the sweep. A million votes cast plus on props one, two, three, and one, two, four across the state of Arizona. Now, prop one, two, three way too close to call. Less than a percentage point between winning and losing or yes and no on Prop 123. That would put three and a half billion dollars into the state coffers for education and it would come from the state land trust. It is very close. We're talking less than 8,000 votes with a million votes cast. At the taping of this show, there were still 100,000 ballots yet to be counted, a lot of those in Maricopa County. Now, the breakdown was it passed fairly easily in Maricopa County. It didn't down in Pima County. So those 100,000 plus votes still to be counted, it matters where in the state they are from. So what we're going to find out in the coming days, whether or not Prop 123 will put those dollars into the classroom. On Prop 124, it was on pension reform. That passed 70 to 30, so that was almost a walkover. State pension reform, it affects only people hired in the future, which should be. Keep your promises to the people you've already committed to and change it if necessary for the future. Now an election update. Uh, Trump easily wins uh, Oregon and uh, sits down with Megyn Kelly. Now in Kentucky, Hillary Clinton four years ago beat Barack Obama by 250,000 votes. Bernie Sanders wins Oregon. But here's what's interesting. I want you to see a piece of video because Bernie Sanders, it was not lost on him what happened in Kentucky. Celebrating his victory about Oregon and mentions the voters in Kentucky. Take a look. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to say a word of thanks to the people of Kentucky. In a, in a closed primary, something I am not all that enthusiastic about, where independents are not allowed to vote, where, where Secretary Clinton defeated Barack Obama by 250,000 votes in 2008. It appears tonight that we're going to end up with about half of the delegates from Kentucky. He ended up with uh, half the delegates. Also, That's right. The super delegates ended up going to Hillary, but it was a split right down the middle in Kentucky. What a difference four years makes. How is he able to do what he's doing? Why is Bernie Sanders so popular? Well, listen to how he talks about Wall Street and the connection to Hillary Clinton. Is the anti-establishment candidate for sure. Take a look. Secretary Clinton has a number of super PACs. <laughs> And in the last filing period, reported receiving $15 million from Wall Street. Our job is to take on Wall Street, not to take their money. So here's what's interesting. They talk about the civil war within the Republican Party. And it's hard to deny that there's a big difference in the Republican Party from Republican leadership and Donald Trump supporters. A lot of people in leadership of the Republican Party scratching their heads of how popular Donald Trump has become. But it's about time the media is starting to talk about the same problem within the Democratic Party. As a matter of fact, we know what happened in Nevada, in the state of Nevada, during the state convention. We reported on the Arizona State Convention where there was an uproar about the votes after the convention was over. It was very civil, but there was a disagreement. It was such a disagreement, we had the head of the Arizona Republican Party on to talk about it. In Nevada, they had their conven convention at the Paris Hotel and Casino on the Strip. It got so out of hand, they called in police and ambulances and got thrown out of the hotel. Now, we've all been to Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What in the world do you have to do to get thrown out of a Vegas casino? Well, the Democrats did it. The Democratic Party got thrown out of the casino. On international news, 
A plane disappeared, flight 804, Egypt Air Flight 804 disappeared over the Mediterranean. It's an A320 Airbus with 66 people on board. It was flying from Paris to Egypt, to Cairo International Airport. It's now being reported that it was a bomb on that aircraft. Now, the questions are being asked, how big was the bomb? How did it get there? Let me remind you of something. If you remember the attacks at the Paris airport, the terrorist attacks, there was a report that came out after that. There was 40 or 50 employees at the Paris International Airport that had terrorist ties. These were active employees, some of them with access to aircraft. Was that the culprit here? We are going to find out in the long run, but it's an interesting thing to consider what's happened. In other news, new overtime laws from the White House. Salaried employees earning $47,000 or less will get or must be paid overtime after 40 hours. That's double the threshold now. Listen to how the vice president is talking about what this will do. Watch Joe Biden. And so this means that if you're actually working beyond the 40-hour week, until you reach a salary of $47,500, you got to get paid for that time. you got to be compensated for that time that you're working beyond the 40 hours a week. This also will have a positive impact on the economy as a whole. It creates a, a virtuous cycle. There's 12 billion more dollars over the next 10 years will go into the economy to people who will spend it all. But under the new rules starting December 1st, and that gives employers six full months to get accustomed to this. I'm starting to hear a little noise and, you know, uh, in, in the background, not here, but in this on this issue, but we don't have enough time. You got six months. That's longer than almost any rule that we put in place. Now, here's the deal. Joe Biden says they have six months to get used to this. Let me tell you how they're going to get used to it. They're going to start firing people. There are ways to get around this. They can do a couple of different things. They can say you're a salaried employee at um, like whatever you're earning now. They'll cut your salary in half or your, um, your what you're valued at. You work the same amount of hours. When you add it in at overtime, you're going to get paid the same amount. They're going to come to you and they're going to say, your job was making 14 bucks an hour, and that was what it was at 40 hours, but you were salaried, so now you're not going to make overtime. Your position now pays half of that. You're going to make the same money because you're going to work the same hours. Do you want the job or do you not want the job? Or they're going to have two managers instead of just one. Each one will work 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week, won't make the overtime. That's what's going to happen. There are ways around it. You're never, and then they'll blame it on the evil business people. Once again, the people they are aiming to help are not going to be helped. That's the problem. People deserve more money, but you've got to do it organically. You're not going to legislate it. Finally, in the city of Phoenix, there is a property tax increase that will happen because they are going to put body cameras on police officers instead of hiring more police officers. That is not the right decision as far as I'm concerned. Coming up in just a moment, we'll talk about the loss of life of Phoenix police officer Dave Glasser giving his life in the line of duty and a great interview about hunting and conservation in Arizona out at the Arizona Archery Club. That's coming up in just a moment, so stick around. And don't forget to find us on all the social media platforms. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course on Twitter. Don't go away. City of Phoenix police officer uh, named Dave, Dave Glasser gave his life in the line of duty this week. Um, and we want to uh, offer our condolences to his family and to the Phoenix Police Department and law enforcement in general. Uh, I have been unashamedly a law enforcement supporter for my whole life. One of my brothers is a police officer. I have a lot of friends in the Phoenix Police Department and, and across the valley friends that are in law enforcement. It is a, a um, much maligned job, but it's more a calling than anything else. Officer Glasser, along with five other Phoenix officers, are responding to a burglary in progress. And as they approached the home, the suspect was inside a minivan in the driveway. As the officers approached... This suspect opened fire and shot and killed Officer Glasser. He survived by a wife and two young children. Um, he's got a family that loved him and who will grow up now without a husband or a father. And I, I've got to tell you, when I talk about law enforcement and my passion for what they do, one of the things we should be reminded of in this situation is the Phoenix Police Department knew the gravity of this injury from the beginning because officers on scene rendered as much aid as they could, but they knew that the injury was probably life-threatening. 
They took him to a helicopter. They flew him to St. Joseph's Hospital, and uh, he died a day later. But there was not one minute that the city of Phoenix was not patrolled. There was not one call for service that went unanswered. The Phoenix Police Department remained professional. And on the, the following day, when Chief Joe Yonner stood with the mayor and members of the city council behind him, and he made the announcement that Officer Glasser had died with his voice, with choking up, um, everybody in Phoenix still did their job. There was not one call for service that was unanswered. And it's something we all should be mindful of. I think most of us have suffered some kind of loss in our life where someone close to us has passed away. When my brother was killed, my life was able to stop. I was able to leave my job for a few days. I was able to go and do what I needed to do for the following weeks and months to just mourn the loss of a close member of my family. And don't be confused. The officers that worked with Dave Glasser considered him a brother because it is a brotherhood. Now, he was raised in the city of Phoenix. He was from here. He's a native of Phoenix, where we filmed this show. He went to Moon Valley High School. This is someone that the department loved very dearly. And even though Joe Yonner said that he didn't know him personally, because, you know, there's a couple of thousand officers in the department, you could hear it in his voice when he made the announcement. This is something that is traumatic to everybody involved, and yet they continue to do their jobs. I say this because as much as sometimes we've seen where police officers have done the wrong thing in the line of duty and those get blown up in the media over and over again, 99.9% .9 of law enforcement does their job for the right reasons and they do it in a way that everyone should be proud of. These are family people, men and women that have families that love them and they know that every time they go to work, it may be their last day. The Phoenix Police Department was reminded of that this week when this happened to Officer Dave Glasser. So I'm going to encourage you to do a couple of things. If you don't know an officer and you come in contact with an officer, just thank them for what they do in the community. Cut them a break. Let them know that you support what they do for a living and make their job a little bit easier because everyone in law enforcement is suffering right now, and especially those in the Phoenix Police Department. And secondly, I'll ask you to look up an organization. It's called the 100 Club of Arizona. The 100 Club of Arizona is an organization mostly made up of, or largely made up of, survivors uh, or injured officers or firefighters. These, they aid first responders. The 100 Club of Arizona gives a, a gift to a family to financially tide them over while something like this happens. They don't ask for anything in return for it. Uh, they don't step in and do anything. They are just there as a service organization. And I believe in what they do. It is a great cause. And at times like these, many of these survivors are able to help families in these first days of this tragic walk. It is a sad day in the Phoenix Police Department and down here in the Valley. So no matter where you are in the state of Arizona, let the police officers know that you support what they do and find an organization like the 100 Club. Do what you can for them so that we can show them in another way, if you're able to financially, that we can step in and help where it is necessary. Coming up in a couple of moments, we are going to be at the Arizona Archery Club. A little bit about hunting and fishing in Arizona, where it's the hunters and the fishermen that fund the game and fish and to make sure that the herds and everything stays the way they should be. They want to protect the forest, and you're going to find out why here in just a moment. So stick around. Hunting season just a few months away. Well, there's a bear hunt, a spring bear hunt going on right now. I don't tell people in the rural parts of the state. Tony Cochera is with me from Arizona Archery Club. Um, talk to me a little bit about the bad name hunters get. As you know, killing an animal is such a horrible thing. The, the animal rights groups seem to be, um, they have a wrong idea of what hunters really are all about. So yeah. give me a little insight into your opinion on hunting. Okay, well, first and foremost, um, there's, there's, there's really a big difference between hunting and killing. Okay, and the big difference is as a conservationist and as a hunter, okay, we number one want to preserve the environment for the game that we hunt. Okay, as an archery hunter, we are, we are, are very, um, I, I, I want to say that we're, we're very engaging in making sure that the environment is not disturbed making sure that, uh, that the species uh, that we're hunting 
has managed populations, and that's done through Arizona Game and Fish, and they do a wonderful job at that. Um, but also, you know, I, I would say the majority of us hunters, okay, we eat what we hunt, right. okay? There's a lot of benefits to wild game. The protein content in the meat is nine times higher than you find beef in the store, as an example. And when, like for instance, when I harvested a bull elk in 2014, um, I ended up with over 400 pounds of meat, and I'm still eating that meat. You know, and it, it's very fresh, organic meat, you know, that type of stuff. Right. So, you know, we, we don't just hunt f for the sport of it, for killing. We're hunters because we want to put food on the table. And the conservation part of it, what were you were telling me earlier, the elk population was uh, nationwide was what, 1906 in, or in, 19 in 1907, the elk population in the entire United States was at 41,000 head, okay? Now we're over 2 million. And that's because we have the game and fish departments. We have groups like SCI, uh, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a Mule Deer Foundation, all these different foundations that do wonderful work around the country. They, they help manage those herds. And you have to manage them. If you don't manage them, you'll end up with, with uh, diseases if there's too many. Okay, and that's been a problem in right. some parts of the United States uh, where there's too many deer or too many elk or whatever species there is, and they end up with diseases. Their, their gene pools um, um, uh, shrink, so to speak, because you'll see, right. the, you'll see a deer out here weighs 300 pounds, and you'll see a deer in a very highly populated area down south is the size of a German Shepherd at 100 pounds. So, you well, know, you, you really have to manage, you have to manage the game, and you also have to make sure, too, that a certain amount of tags are issued per the head count in that particular part of the state, which is where, which is why we have world record elk that come out of Arizona, et cetera. Well, you're going to take me through a shot because mm -hmm. it looks easy. We watch a hundred <laughs> shows on TV. You're going to take me through sure. a shot. Now we're only shooting about 10 yards downrange. That's right. Take me through the shot okay. and then tell me how I do. How's okay. that sound? Absolutely. All right, let's you load one up. Let's okay. give it a try. Okay, for sure. All right. So we kind of went over a little bit of basics, but, uh, Let's start with that with that bow hand, okay? So remember, like you're yeah. like you're telling me to stop, okay? So what you want to do is you want to rotate that hand and drop that wrist, and then you want the riser of the bow to be on this part of your hand. Gotcha. Reason why is because we want the most minimal amount of contact between your hand and the bow. Any if you're contacting the bow too much, you're going to torque it left and right, and that's going to send All your right. shots downrange where they're not supposed to be. So I'll go ahead and load this arrow up for you. Okay. All right. So now with your, with your draw hand, all your fingers are behind the trigger. You're good to go. We're going to establish that anchor point at full draw. Okay. So we're going to bring that down just like that. String is on the tip of your nose. Just like that. Your hand's relaxed. Index that pin on the target. There you go. I hit the target. Just like that. The other part of this I really love is, and I'm glad they're here, you got families that come out. Yes. And even from the target practice, spending time together, it's just a great family sport where yes. fathers and daughters and fathers and sons and mothers can come out. It's just a great family environment. Yes, absolutely. We have a ton of families that shoot in here. Uh, Terry and Haley are, are, are one example out of, out of a, many. Um, we also have the Junior Olympic Archery Development Program. Uh, which is a program that we have for kids. It's sanctioned by the uh, Olympic Committee out of, uh, out of Colorado Springs. And we have about 85 kids in that program. And actually, the, believe it or not, the majority of our kids are girls. Uh, so we actually have more girls in our JOAD program than we do boys. And so, you know, the, they're, they're the moms and dads, if, they, if they're not shooters, they end up becoming certified coaches to help the rest right. of the JOAD and help their own kid. And it's, the families are very engaged. So it, 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 one, thing, one thing that's, that's great about archery is it's completely gender neutral. I mean, you, like you just drew a 65 pound bow back, which is a right. heavy bow, you know, you're, you're, you're a strong guy, you can do that. Well, when you have a 10 year old girl who only draws 23 pounds, she could be standing in this lane right next to you and just drilling the bullseye and you're missing all over the place. So Man, it doesn't Which is matter. probably more likely right. to happen. Right. Thanks so the, for pointing that yeah, out, so, by the so, way. So, so the, <laughs> the, draw, the draw weight of the bow really is in, in, in archery, in target archery, is totally insignificant. 
So, you know, it is very gender neutral and uh, it's, it's a great sport for families. Well, listen, Arizona Archery Club and the address, what's your address? It's 1115 West Deer Valley Road. So we're on 11th Avenue in Deer Valley, right across the street from the Deer Valley Airport. Whether you're an established hunter or you want to do something with the family, it is a great place to come out and hunt. You're seeing a father and daughter here today and you do yourself a favor and check it out and be an informed person because hunters are the ones that fund Arizona Game and Fish, manage the herds, and they want to preserve the forest and the game for future generations. Tony, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. We'll be right back. All right, it's always something connected to Arizona and something really good. It's called Broomhead's Best. This week, I was honored to speak at Boy Scout Troop 109 in Scottsdale, Arizona, where they inducted eight new Eagle Scouts. I don't know if any of you ever been involved in scouting, but to make Eagle Scout is really hard work. These kids start sometimes at the age of 10, and it takes them eight, sometimes nine years to get their Eagle Scout. It is an amazing accomplishment, and to have eight of them from the same Boy Scout troop is an incredible accomplishment. So I was there and asked to speak and was moved because I couldn't believe the hard work and dedication of these eight young men, all of them thanking their fathers and other mentors for helping them through the process. Each one had a short video that showed their journey to make their Eagle Scout. So it really was terrific. And then at the end where they take an oath, the Eagle Oath at the end, they asked the other Eagle Scouts in the crowd to be with them. And so the Eagle Scouts stood behind the eight being inducted. There were about 30 people on the stage, and they all took the Eagle Oath together. It was a moving experience to see this. We're talking young men at the age of 18 that are getting their Eagle Scout, but they made the commitment much younger. It renews your faith in what's going on with our youth, and it really is deserving of this week's Broomhead's Best. So congratulations to the eight young men in Troop 109 from Scottsdale. It really is terrific. And now we have something burning up the internet. We call it hashtag this. This one's called hashtag panhandler picnic. Massachusetts State Trooper Luke Bonin is his name, and he decided to interact with a homeless woman. Her name is Lynn Murphy. She has four children. Now, she was sitting on the side of the road by herself, and when the trooper stopped, she thought he was going to give her a citation. But instead, he brought two bagged lunches, one for her and one for him, and just decided to find out what her story is. I thought this was terrific because people treat homeless people as, as a pariah. They don't interact very much. I had a cousin who was homeless and used to interact with him all the time. I have a different view of homeless people. Congratulations to the state trooper who wants no publicity for what happened. A passerby took a picture and made it viral on the Internet. So go and find it. We're calling it hashtag panhandler picnic. We'll be back in a moment. Don't forget to find us on all the social media platforms. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course on Twitter. Don't go away. Before we close it out, the city of Phoenix uh, has got a budget put forward, and I don't want to—I don't want to cloud an officer dying with what I'm about to say. The two are not connected. But in the city budget, they want to fund uh, body cameras for all of the police officers. Millions of dollars to do this. But the Phoenix Police Department is short about 700 police officers on the streets. They need to fund police officers. Take a look at whatever city you live in in the budget and what they're doing for law enforcement and first responders. It's the first responsibility of any city for public safety. Without Phoenix police having enough officers, it doesn't matter what body cameras you put on them. We've got to get officers on the street so they can be proactive and stop crime and not just fight crimes in progress, which is what they've been reduced down to. It depends on what kind of city you want to live in. It's just my opinion. We'll be back next week. Have a great week, everyone. God bless. Get more of Mike Broomhead on Facebook, Twitter, and of course weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on News Talk 550 KFYI.